Wonderful. It's really fantastic uh, to be here. Thank you so much, Barbara, for the very warm welcome. And I'm very honored to be here. It's a great honor for me to talk about Telus Idea and the Jordan Valley and burials, um, because this is only the second time I've actually had the chance to do this in Jordan. I was at a conference um, at uh, Yarmouk University um, about a month ago, which was a great pleasure. That was the first time I'd had a chance to talk about my research uh, actually in Jordan and share it with uh, people in Jordan. So it's really fantastic that I can do this and share this with all of you here. Um, so uh, esteemed friends and colleagues, it's a really fantastic pleasure for me to, uh, to be here this evening and a great honor to, for me to give a lecture for ACOR. And I want to thank, of course, uh, our director, Dr. Barbara Porter, for the opportunity and to thank everyone who helps to make these lectures possible, especially Miriam Saleh and Sarah Harpending, who do a lot of behind the scenes work, as you know. Um, this is also a great chance for me to present my personal research, uh, particularly that which stands for my PhD, which was um, amazingly 12 years ago, um, not, not that I'm counting, um, and present on the work of uh, my work on the cemetery at Telus Idea, which will, will form a good portion of my talk here today. I want to thank a few people in advance, uh, because otherwise I'll forget to. They provided support and guidance over the years, access to collections and archives in the UK, uh, Netherlands, US, and of course in Jordan, especially the staff of the Department of Antiquities and the Dara Saraya Museum in Erbid. And I wish to express special thanks to colleagues at the British Museum, especially Jonathan Tubb, Caroline Cartwright, and Rupert Chapman. Um, who excavated at Telus Idea. I admit that I did not excavate at Telus Idea myself um, in the 80s and 90s. And they um, share the goal of uh, publication of the British Museum-led um, excavations. And with that, I'd just like to briefly summarize uh, the outline of my lecture. Um, first of all, I'm going to situate the archaeology of death and burial, more in sort of anthropological terms. And then, after that, I'm going to take us to the main geographical area of focus, that is the uh, Jordan Valley, and explain why this subregion um, is quite important for the study of burial customs, and also how it presents some challenges um, in terms of preservation um, and different types of uh, how topography affects preservation and contextual resolution. I'll then provide a chronological overview of the burials in the Jordan Valley for this very long period of time. It's a very long period. It's about um, over 2,000 years. So we're really focusing on a period from about the late third millennium BC to around the second century BC. So in the interest of time, I'll really be just focusing on snapshots of some of these sites. Uh, so you'll have to bear with me um, with some of this. Uh, I'll present some of the key interpretations of those burials. Um, but most of all, I will focus on Telus idea um, as it presents this very contextually, contextually rich um, set of discoveries for mortuary customs for the Late Bronze and the uh, Iron Ages. And then I'll present some scenarios and uh, interpretations of why, what kind of patterns we're seeing um, and why uh, things change. Are they due to external or internal factors, for example, that affect uh, the way people treat the dead and the way that they, uh, their attitudes towards death? So um, this uh, next slide, we're going to focus a little bit on the uh, aspects of archaeology of death and burial and also the anthropology, uh, the anthropology of ritual in relation to death. It's first of all very important to remember that regardless of who we are and where we come from and what we believe, everyone dies. Um, there are practical as well as social and cultural factors that play a role in how the living deal with death and the dead. From the treatment of the physical body, the preparation of the burial place, to the funerary rituals and the customs that help the living to gather together and honor the dead, and activities that allow us to remember and also, to some extent, forget the dead. Death is a very disruptive event. Everyday life stops and families and communities have to prepare for the funeral and begin to grieve. For the living, dealing with death is closely tied to memory a sense of place, identity, and family. Death also provides opportunities to reflect on religious or cosmological beliefs, and this also generates strong feelings and emotions. 
And I want to give you three really main takeaway points as we go through this, because it's going to be lots of burials and data and objects and things like that. But I want you to think about, first of all, it's really the living who prepare and deal with the dead. When we see a burial in the ground um, we've excavated, the dead person didn't just walk in there and put, put himself down as a person. Their, their um, identity, is, in a sense, has been kind of managed by the living. Um, secondly, so, so basically, the identity that you find in a grave may not necessarily reflect the identity of the deceased individual as they were in life or how they perceived themselves. Secondly, there are many aspects of preparation and remembering the dead that take place away from or outside of the place of burial. And these are very unlikely to be preserved archaeologically. What we may be able to deduce from burial data is really only a small fraction of the overall funerary activities that take place uh, at the time of a funeral. And then thirdly, we can't really excavate beliefs or feelings. But what we can say, however, is that the burial episode is an extremely powerful ritually charged event that may engage members of a family or a community. Death can be painful, stressful, intense, memorable. It brings people together and it also can divide. In anthropological terms, um, it's important to acknowledge the work of Alfred Van Gennep, whose cross-cultural analysis of the rites of passage over a century ago still provides an important framework for those studying death and burial. Edmund Leach uh, later reconfigured Van Gennep's work in his application of mortuary customs um, as applied to archaeological findings, maintaining a common theme of three ritual stages that relate to key marking events from birth to ad adolescence, marriage, and death. So here we have the example that you could potentially apply to death and burial, for example. These are all these things, birth, marriage, adolescence, uh, death, they all have this common tripartite structure of uh, separation, transition, and incorporation. And when you think about this, and I, I try to attempt this with trying to apply it to burial data, you can start to break it down and see how the, the aspects of separation, that relates to the, the physical death, and then people having to respond to that. Um, the, dead, the dead is separated from the living, and then the, the body is prepared for burial. There's also transition that could involve the journey to the burial place and the actual burial itself. The deceased person, as well as potentially their spirit, depending on the beliefs of the people um, that, that burying the dead, um, will go through a transitionary state. Um, so there, it's a very it's a time of pollution as well for the uh, in terms of the body. People they have to be very careful in this particularly sort of dangerous and potentially polluting time. And this could uh, involve, um, it's a very intense time. And then also you have the period after uh, the uh, burial in which you might have uh, a few years in which people are gradually adjusting to this change of state of the individual, of the deceased individual. And this affects memory, it affects the way that perhaps rituals and activities that take place on um, a periodic basis and perhaps visitations to the tombs. And then of course we have the acts of incorporation and that's when really the deceased and perhaps their spirit, um, depending on beliefs, um, has really entered a different phase and they've become incorporated perhaps with other ancestors. Or at least they've entered a different realm. They're no longer um, in the realm of the living or in this in-between phase. The body, the bodily parts have decayed and we're left really with bones. And really things like handling human remains, secondary burial treatment, you can see these as playing a really key role in those kinds of activities to do with incorporation, incorporation of ancestors and uh, relationships between the living and the dead. Now, we've covered that sort of anthropological introduction, and now I want to focus on the uh, topography and the Jordan Valley itself, this particular unit that we're looking at here. Um, so this map here is, um, is great because it shows the broad topography, but we're really dealing here with this part of the Jordan Valley here, the central Jordan Valley. And you can see, um, obviously, it's, it, you've got the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. There's obviously a, a big difference between the hill countries on both sides. The, you've got a very uh, a great degree of difference in topography here. And um, the Jordan Valley, as you can see from this um, slide that shows uh, the site of Deir Allah and the view looking forward uh, on the north of that. 
um, that it's a very rich um, area agriculturally. It's always been a fertile area. And in particular, you can see this because you see the uh, very uh, uh, strong flowing uh, streams and wadis that come through from the, um, the banks, the wadis uh, down, like the Wadi Kufringa here that flow into the Jordan River itself. And of course, with springs, wadis, this provides um, a very lush environment despite having a relatively low rainfall. This is still a really semi-step uh, region. And because of this, you also have a lot of alluvium that is spread across the landscape. And this is great for farming, of course, but it also means that you have uh, tell sites that emerge in the landscape and also a lot of um, a very rich farmland. And you can see here, it's a very important communication route as well. So you see in the middle here, the site of Telus idea, um, the Tel, and it's really very close. It's only a couple of kilometers from the River Jordan itself, um, but to the north, towards Pella, and then onwards to Syria. And then of course, on the other side of the river towards uh, Beth Shan, Beisan, and the Jezreel Valley, and the Mediterranean coast and then on, on, on towards Shechem and Tel Balata. Um, and then towards the south, you've got the Dead Sea and Deir Allah. And this was very important for communication, for trade, and also in terms of conflict and border uh, maintenance, because this is obviously uh, a place where it's, it's an important boundary um, between kingdoms, between empires, between uh, city-states. And of course, this may well affect the way in which uh, settlement patterns have developed over the uh, centuries. Um, so just to get, keep that in mind, um, Telus idea here is very well placed. It's right in the center of the valley. And this is a very open kind of landscape. Um, and you can imagine that movement between uh, these tells uh, would have, could have been potentially quite uh, fluid and open. Um, here we have a really, I wanted to show the differences in topography and also how this could affect the kinds of burials customs that you have uh, in tell sites and also in sort of hill country and more uh, highland sites. So for example, here is the site of Telus idea uh, above and you see the two, the, the, the imposing double mound of Telus idea with the upper tell and the lower tell cemetery um, on the right hand side. And all the burials that I'll be talking about later are, are cut into that cemetery. Um, so they're cut into um, habitation remains from earlier periods. So mud brick was the predominant building material um, at this particular site. Um, whereas in the, um, in the highland regions, such as at Tel Hispan, and we see these, uh, you can see just over here, and I'm very grateful to Barbara for this uh, photograph, um, just on this side, we see some of the cave tombs opposite the site of the uh, Tel Hisban, which is a very important site, uh, particularly in the Iron Age. And you have a completely different topography, and people are making use of the landscape in a different way, using cave tombs, uh, cutting into uh, the hillsides, and uh, using those for successive burial use. So... Um, that really affects uh, preservation in a major way, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, also, the types of building materials here, you see the contrast between the valley, which you see, uh, for example, at Telus idea, you see the use of mud brick is very predominant, but also a mixture of uh, stone and mud brick. Whereas in some of the highland areas, such as uh, this photograph from Kobit al Medina al Alia, near Karak, you can see that the buildings were made mostly of stone because that's the available building material. There's not so much available for making uh, mud brick. So these choices, they, th these um, kinds of uh, factors in the landscape, they affect the kind of choices that people uh, make in terms of burial uh, customs. And you can see this, for example, the pit burials that you have at Tel Asaidia here, which are cut into the tell, and they're all individual burials for the most part, this provides very strong contextual resolution. We have individuals, we can uh, age and sex those human remains, and we can actually identify the objects that were deposited with them. Whereas when we look at some of the cave tombs uh, that were reused over generations, such as this one in the uh, Bakar Valley near uh, Amman, this you can see is a commingled set of remains. There are a few burial episodes that are preserved at the very end of use, 
where you see some articulation, but it's very difficult to associate objects with individuals. So the amount of information we can get from the burials on the left, the pit burials, is much greater than the information you can get from this. It's different information, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's a different level of contextual resolution. So now, after we've covered that, I want to now begin this um, journey uh, through the chronology. Um, and I'm going to start actually in the early Bronze Age um, with dolmens. And I have, I, first of all, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on dolmens. And these date really from the mostly the third millennium BC. I'm not going to spend much time on dolmens because many of you know about dolmens and they're kind of quite iconic. Um, because there's also a great lecture by Jamie Fraser from last year that you can find on the ACOR website. So I want you to go, if you're interested in finding, more, finding out more, go to the um, ACOR website, find Jamie Fraser's lecture, uh, because all the information is there. But what I'll summarize briefly, um, that Jamie's work is really helping us to understand uh, these burial sites in particular, because uh, as you see here, these are megalithic structures. They are built from stone slabs, and often you get these upright stone slabs that either uh, above ground or they're partially subterranean. Some of them have doorways and holes so you can get into like sort of portholes and these uh, and they have a sort of capstone on the top. Quite a high degree of investment uh, for use and also reuse. We from the uh, scant human remains that have been found in these tombs it does indicate that they were used for burial primarily and that they were probably used by uh, for burial of people in nearby settlements and the visibility of these two nearby settlements was quite important. This changes a bit some of the viewpoints that these used to be associated primarily with nomadic uh, peoples. This is now being changed um, in part through Jamie's work. Um, and it's interesting the continuity level of these because of the contextual resolution it's really hard to actually um, uh, identify and you know, the preservation level is often very poor, and these are very much under threat from development as well. They're often uh, destroyed within the landscape. Um, but the, they're often found without human rema remains or very few objects. Um, and this really affects our ability to understand um, the burial customs. But what's interesting is we have use from the early Bronze Age right into, it seems, into the MB period as well. Um, I was at a talk recently by Stephen Collins, um, who was talking about his excavations Tel El Hammam, which is also in the Jordan Valley near the Dead Sea. And he says that he found a, they found a, a dolmen which contained some Middle Bronze Age pottery. So this, and this indicated some reuse uh, over a very long period of time. So this really suggests that you could have a lot of continuity of use. But the predominant usage seems to be in the um, early Bronze Age, in the, mostly in the third millennium BC. Um, then moving on, we, we have the site of Baba Dra, which is a very famous site, um, um, really on the uh, southern part of the Dead Sea there. And um, really in the very early part of the Early Bronze Age, uh, we see these uh, shaft tombs. And this is a shaft tomb tradition that is really quite widespread uh, through the region. And we see the very careful use of um, uh, or placement of human remains um, in often secondary burials. So, so this is where you have remains of individuals who have already uh, died and their bodies have decayed and their human remains have been cleaned and then they've been removed and placed carefully. Here you see in this uh, wonderful photograph um, the skulls lined up and also the bones which may have been in some kind of basket or, or bag um, because they're very closely uh, tied to each other as well as pottery and other objects. All of this seems to indicate close relationships between the living and the dead in terms of handling the deceased over extended periods of time. So reopening tombs, re-engaging with the dead. And this seems to point to kinship connections. We have individuals of mixed um, uh, age and gender within these tombs that's, that could indicate that we have family groups um, within some of these burials. And this, um, this, this continues. Uh, but also in um, Baba Dra in a slightly later period, a, f uh, a couple of hundred years later, we have this very interesting finding of a charnel house. And 
these, uh, this charnel house was outside of the settlement, um, and it also seems to have been a kind of a place where human remains were stored and kind of curated in a sense. So what we have here is what, how it's been uh, interpreted as a kind of body library. And the beautiful illustrations here I want to give reference to for Eric Carlson, but also to reference the work of uh, Schaub and Rast, as well as Meredith Chesson, done huge amounts of work on understanding um, the um, uh, early Bronze Age here. And I want to reference a, an excellent article by David Elam as well um, on mortuary practices, which I have put reference to in the slide. Um, we're going to move on now to Jericho. Um, and of course, Jericho is very famous because, not just because of Kathleen Kenyon, who excavated it, but it's one of the most excavated sites um, in the region. But we have, uh, of course, the discovery of these plastered skulls from the, um, from the Neolithic period. So we know that the, the site of Jericho was inhabited about ten, up to about 10,000 years ago. It's one of the oldest um, settlements known. And of course, um, plastered skulls have also been found uh, recently uh, in, in Jordan, at, at Tel Abu Sawan. So we know that this is a tradition that's also found uh, in Jordan. Um, but I'm not going to focus on this, but it gives you an idea of the sense of handling of human remains. Um, we have the modification of human skulls and the creation of a kind of new identity or portrait through the uh, plastering of these human skulls in the Neolithic period. But I'm going to look at the early Bronze Age um, because it's interesting that in the EB, uh, for the EB4 or the intermediate early Bronze, uh, middle Bronze period, at the, towards the end of the late third millennium BC, when Kathleen Kenyon was excavating these shaft tombs, she noticed this difference in burial customs that seems to take place in this period. This is a time in which the cities basically seem to uh, collapse or are abandoned. For the most part, there are still some small settlements. But we see a big decline in the urban setting that we had already before that in the early Bronze Age. Um, and then the appearance of these uh, burials, often with weapons, these single burials, and she calls them the dagger type tombs. And she associated this as well as the finding of this uh, Kerbet Kerak, where this black burnished pottery with the invasion of Amorites, uh, this group of people that she saw as being responsible for the destruction of the early Bronze Age. We now know that this interpretation is um, wrong, basically, and it's, uh, there are a lot of problems with it because, of course, this pottery appears long before the destruction of the uh, city-states of the early Bronze Age. But also, um, th th there were already traditions of making weapons, but this seems to be a change in the um, way in which the dead are, treated, uh, are being treated and being represented in this sort of warrior type pose. And it could be something to do with the instability that's happening at the time. Obviously, we've got the, uh, the city-states have kind of come to, um, come to a close. We've got much more nomadic, um, much more of a nomadic population. And it's, there's this term, sort of the complex nomad, the, this, um, these people who could actually still make uh, these complex tools and weapons um, but ne didn't necessarily uh, live in cities or in an urban setting. Um, so we have this complete, this, this different change. I want you to hold on to this idea of the, first of all, the individual burial and also the sort of warrior identity that's being expressed here. Um, when we move into the Middle Bronze Age, uh, from about 1750 uh, to about 1550, we have really remarkable uh, changes in burial customs. We have much larger uh, cave tombs um, here. These shaft tombs are continuing, but they're burying many more individuals in here, and there's a lot more reuse. And this where we seem to have, again, a mixture of, uh, of men, women, and also sometimes children as well. And we also have amazing preservation of um, furniture, organic um, objects in these tombs, <coughs> trays, baskets, tables, benches, etc. This is really important because it gives us a really unique glimpse into the kinds of things that aren't usually preserved archaeologically. And so it's very important for us to think about this when we look at other burials. But what we have here is really um, this focus on uh, multiple internment, but also it's a very cosmopolitan culture. Uh, the material culture at the time, as well as con continuity of tools and weapons and graves, you've got the presence of Egyptian-type scarabs. But this is at a time when the Egyptians are not involved politically directly in the region. 
So there's not a sort of imperial imposition, as we'll see a bit later in the Late Bronze Age. So, um, and also, I want to refer to the work here of Rachel Halote because um, uh, this her, her uh, focus on the burials at Jericho has been quite illuminating because she's really looked at this in terms of the burial assemblages. What kinds of things do you have in these tombs? What kinds of identities are being expressed in death? Do these reflect the kinds of identities that were reflected in life? Um, and she thinks that really this is a, an expression of kind of a household identity um, because, and you can see here, even the excavators at the time who did these illustrations back in the 50s and uh, late 50s, they, they saw how the burials could help to inform you about how people actually lived. They, this reconstruction is based on that illustration in the top left corner. So it gives you a sense of the kind of idealization of household and family life uh, within the tombs in terms of the kinds of things that are being deposited in the tombs, storage jars, serving vessels, um, a lot of things to do with furniture, um, cosmetics, um, implements for um, decoration, personal adornment. These are um, sort of the finery, th the, this is the finery of life really. We're not seeing a lot of things like cooking pots or food preparation vessels. Those kind of things aren't maybe as important. Maybe those aren't the sort of things that people wanted to express in the tombs. But it is, again, this multiple burial mode, lots of reuse, uh, kinship groups potentially um, burying their dead over generations in the same place over time. Now we're moving into the Late Bronze Age, after 1550 BC. And really, um, Pella has a lot of continuity of burial practices, and I'll be moving on to Pella in a moment. But there's an important site, uh, because it's not too far away from Telesidea. It's a Kateret Asamra, and it's very, very close to the River Jordan. And you can see here the recent publications, actually, uh, of Kateret Asamra, um, uh, which just came out last year. Um, it's, very, uh, uh, it's a fairly small site, but again, shaft tombs. These are fairly small shaft tombs dug into the, um, into the rock here. And placements of one or two or more individuals. So some of these have multiple individuals in them. So you have this continuity of the pattern of the Middle Bronze Age tombs, but with fewer objects. We don't see as much of the cosmopolitan nature of pottery. This, we're not seeing a lot of imported, we don't see imported wares, but we do see painted pottery. We see um, some of the uh, vessels here that are found in situ. Um, but that's a very early burial in the Late Bronze Age. Uh, up to about 1300 BC. And now I'll, I'll move to Pella, um, Pella or Tabakat Fa'al, um, which is further north uh, in the Jordan Valley and excavated by University um, of Sydney. Um, in the uh, 1960s, though, there was an excavation by the Department of Antiquities um, here, and they found um, a really amazing tomb cut into the mound of Tel El Husson, which is opposite the main site of, Tel of, of Pella. Um, so opposite the temple, the palace, the, those buildings. And cut into this uh, tomb, it's not fully published, uh, was a, a really impressive uh, rock cut tomb. And it contained all kinds of objects in there that seemed to indicate a very elite presence. And um, Stephen Bork, who's been excavating there for many years, believes that this may be the tomb of La Bayou, or perhaps Mutbalu, who were uh, the kings of Pella identified in the Amarna letters, because, which were the, co the correspondence between kings uh, in Canaan and Egypt at that time. And you can see the kinds of uh, cosmopolitan material that we find here. We have many imports from the Aegean. There are Egyptian-style stone vessels, Egyptian-style pottery, and also Cypriot pottery, and also anthropoid style, uh, anthropoid clay coffins. Um, there's no reported, there's no actual known images of these, but the, um, according to the descriptions uh, that are published, um, they seem to be fairly similar to the ones that are found at Beth Shan or Beisan across the river, um, which is uh, related to um, an Egyptian garrison there, um, and probably dating to the late bronze, uh, end of the late bronze age and the beginning of the iron age. Uh, we don't know the date of the, the anthropoid coffins found at Pella, 
because we um, don't know what they look like. But um, I just want to, it raises this whole issue about the possibilities of direct Egyptian influence or indirect Egyptian influence in the region. As we have um, this sort of new, sort of uh, new different type of uh, burial custom that appears, this uh, clay anthropoid coffin, and, and people have identified these as being either, say, Egyptians or Sea Peoples. There's a lot of debate about it. I'm not going to get into that. But it's very interesting to note that at Sahab in Jordan and also in the capital here in Amman, they've uh, found anthropoid coffins made of clay that date to a bit later, a few centuries later, um, in the Iron II. And there doesn't seem to be a direct connection or continuity between them. But I just thought I'd just throw this in uh, because it's an important finding. And you can see some of these, of course, in the Amman Citadel Museum. And lastly, for Pella, this rather grisly finding that we have, um, which was found in the entrance of the tomb that was discovered by uh, the Australian excavations, and that is these manacles that were found around the legs of a poor individual who'd had his head chopped off. And this has been confirmed by osteological analysis. And this dates to this period, probably the closure of the tomb in around 1300 BC. Something happened. This person was manacled and executed in probably full view of what was going on across the way uh, on the other side of, of uh, Tel al Husn. So we don't know the circumstances of this, but I think it speaks to some of the uh, insecurities and difficulties and challenges that we may read about in the Amarna letters, perhaps. And you can see this in the Urbid Museum uh, as well. Uh, now I'm going to move on to Telesidea, um, uh, and I'll focus most of uh, the rest of the talk on, on Sidea. Um, Telesidea, as I mentioned before, is a double mound. Uh, it's right in the center of the uh, Jordan Valley, roughly equidistant between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. And you can see the um, upper mound, and that's the settlement, and then the lower mound, which is the cemetery. Um, and you can also see how lush the landscape is around it for farming. So this must have been a very appealing uh, uh, area to live in. But also, it was also important for defense. And there's also a very elaborate water system. You can see the scar in the upper tell there. There's a water system that dates to the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age there. Um, and I'm not going to focus much on the upper tell uh, for this lecture because I want to focus on the cemetery itself. So here you have the plan of the cemetery and the settlement. So it was excavated by James Pritchard in the 1960s, the University of Pennsylvania, and then by the British Museum in the 80s and 90s. And you can see that the cemetery takes up quite a large portion of this, and it's pretty flat But um, what you, right now, but you actually have lots of vari variability in topography uh, in the past. And the reason for that is because there's an early Bronze Age settlement that's actually uh, uh, constructed on that lower mound. And that's what was uh, the focus of excavations. And actually, the cemetery uh, is actually cutting into the early Bronze Age material. You can see a skeleton here from the cemetery that's actually cut directly into the early Bronze Age settlement. Um, this is a rough, uh, this is a overview of the chronology for the cemetery. And during my PhD, I, I tried to consolidate the work of Pritchard with the work of Jonathan Tubb in the British Museum uh, to be able to analyze the, the burial samples that I was looking at. And so what, we, what I, I characterized them as was basically period one, which corresponds with the late 13th, uh, going through to the uh, late uh, or mid to late uh, 12th century, and then uh, period two, which corresponds with uh, really the later part of the Iron I period uh, and going through to the early Iron II period. So we have uh, really here, um, this, this covers really the 11th, perhaps through to the 10th and maybe 9th centuries uh, BC. Later on, there seems to be a bit of a gap, and then we have phase four, which I will talk about later in respect to the Iron II C and Persian period graves of the 6th through to the 2nd century uh, BC. Um, this is a sort of schematic drawing of the cemetery in the central area. Just to go back, I want to show you the uh, place I'm talking about. It's just a small square here, um, is what we have 
in here. So you can see it's quite densely used, this cemetery. And what you also have is the appearance of these pit graves, these individual pits and pithos graves. But also you can see that they're quite well organized in terms of rows or columns of burials across the burial mound. Um, and this speaks to a quite high degree of cemetery organization in this period. Um, this seems to have been laid out deliberately um, uh, by someone or an, some kind of authority or community. Uh, we don't know quite how, but that's how they, they did it. And we see in the um, uh, period one, this focus on individual interment as, as being predominant. And we have some very interesting burial customs, including the very tight binding of the human remains, um, as you can see here with the constricted shoulders. And you also have the uh, bronze objects that are sometimes found wrapped in linen. And we have the preserved uh, uh, mineralized textile on bronze objects that show the bodies were wrapped in, in linen. Um, many of them were wrapped. Um, and you can see some of the barrels are fairly simple. Um, and they contain just really a few objects. Some of them contain many objects, and some of them contain very special objects. Some of the objects include Egyptian-type pottery. This is a type of pottery that is known from Egypt, and it's, but it's made locally. And there have been numerous studies of this, and it does seem to be a very specific type of pottery that emulates or takes on elements of Egyptian production. So it's either made by Egyptians or people who were trained by Egyptians in, uh, in this. And th they are, it's very different in terms of the patterning of this type of pottery. And it seems to speak to overall a kind of Egyptian influence in the cemetery that seems to go beyond just um, emulation. But we do have, of course, very nice objects like this ivory um, cosmetic dish of a fish in a bronze bowl. And this is much more sort of a high status or prestigious type of object. And that's the kind of thing that you might expect to be more to do with, say, elite emulation. You know, people perhaps wanting to be more Egyptian and using objects um, that uh, are very prestigious. Um, so we have some very interesting material in the graves, including bent weapons. Um, and we also have imports, uh, these Mycenaean uh, and also Cypriot imports, stirrup jars, and also locally made examples of the same thing. And this pinpoints the late 13th to 12th centuries uh, BC. Uh, here's some more pottery from the, uh, from the site, uh, from the period one ceramic types. Pretty simple. And sometimes you get some rather special objects again, such as this uh, tomb 331, which is a male, adult male individual. And he was buried with this... Um, uh, this bronze bowl, but also a, um, a dagger and a, a gold seal, seal ring that was very Egyptian in style. And so um, this all seems to point to um, strong connections or associations with an elite Egyptian identity. And when we looked at sites like Beth Shan, Beisan in the north, which we know is a garrison site, this kind of material fits in very well with that kind of scenario. We don't know if these people are Egyptians, or if they are Canaanites, or if they're a combination of, of the two. We can't just tell based on the object, but we know there's a strong uh, degree of Egyptian influence here. And we also see this, rather strangely, in the placement or pouring of bitumen, liquid bitumen, over the body in a couple of the tombs. These were excavated by Pritchard. And this is actually um, bitumen that was found over the body. So it seems that the body was covered with bitumen. And this could be an attempt at sort of mummification. And then some very unusual and elaborate body treatments as well, such as this face down burial um, in tomb 46 of a young woman. But with many objects, this had, um, I think, I can't remember exactly how many objects, but it's certainly in the 20s in terms of the numbers of objects found in this tomb. So quite a diverse set of remains indicating a, a kind of expression of elite status in death. And also there are ivory objects found, including this uh, very fragmentary uh, ivory gaming box and this small pyxis. So again, these seem to indicate some quite strong uh, connections with the international sort of Egyptianizing uh, world at the time. A very wealthy tomb, tomb 101, was very difficult for me to place chronologically into my two periods. 
So I didn't actually place it because it was actually too rich and it, it skewed all the data. So <laughs> what I ended up doing was actually uh, s separately uh, discussing this in my thesis. But what I think we have here is this uh, Tomb 101. It's got ivory objects, it's got bronze vessels, bronze wine sets. It's got um, a jar that seems to indicate coastal connections, possibly a wine jar. So I think what we have here is someone or a rich family that's burying a deceased person that really wants to express an elite identity through these connections with the coast. But it was actually this tomb and some others that have led some to suggest that there were sea peoples buried at the site of Telesidea. The bronze vessels, uh, for example, found in the tomb 101, uh, Pritchard suggested this indicated some connections with Cyprus and, and Phoenicia, but also this could indicate that we have sea peoples uh, at Telesidea. There's also the indications of the bronze working in biblical sources. And also there's some debate about the Deir Allah tablets, about whether they represent a foreign or a local script. But I don't want to get into that too much. And I actually, my feeling is to be very cautious about burials and identifying them uh, with ethnic groups. Um, I, this is one of the other tombs that was uh, discussed by Jonathan Tubb as being potentially Sea People's Burial. Um, I'm not sure if that's really the case because also we have similar types of uh, tombs across Syro-Mesopotamia, but we, can't, we have to be very, very careful about trying to identify a particular burial type with a particular ethnic group. But I will say there's something a little bit different about the double pithos burials that is worth investigating further. Um, so I'm not going to speculate any further, but just to say we have to be very, very careful and cautious about ethnicity in the region here. Now I'm moving on to period two. So we've moved on from this sort of cosmopolitan period of the Late Bronze Age, which seems to be, um, is under really the aegis of Egypt at that time, the Egyptian empire is in control, to this period in which the Egyptians have basically left. And we don't see the same kinds of things in this period, but what we do see is continuity in the use of the cemetery. These um, tombs and graves were buried directly on top of the burials that you saw just before. And so there seems to be continuity. There's great care in not disturbing many of the graves below. Uh, so it seemed, they seem to know that there, there were other burials there underneath, and some of them um, seem to be very careful not to disturb. And we have um, some of these mud brick built kist or cyst tombs, some of which contain multiple individuals, as well as individual graves. So we're seeing um, a pattern moving towards um, multiple burials and reuse of these tombs sometimes reuse of pit graves as well. And it becomes very intensely used at this time. We see more rows of burials, and this seems to indicate a lot of overcrowding in the cemetery. So that could be an explanation for the reuse. But it's a very different pattern overall, but still the same orientation, and also some of the same uh, types of objects and selections of objects too. Also seeing as this example here, of tomb 282, we have about 11 individuals in this tomb, and they include men, women, and children, and infants. So we have um, really what could be, we don't know for sure, of course, a kinship group or a family group that is using and reusing this tomb for burial. And these, what we see, though, interestingly, is a much reduced number of objects overall, far fewer objects. Uh, we see, uh, for example, the odd jug, maybe a storage jar, uh, we see uh, juglets and pixides become very, very common indeed, and occasionally iron tools and weapons. Um, bronze ornaments become very common in this period, but we don't see, for example, the, the uh, uh, bowls become very rare. Um, so bowls were very common, ceramic bowls were very common in the first period. They almost completely disappear in the, uh, in the second period, and um, I've been trying to sort of explain why this might be the case. Um, this is a, a, a very um, wonderfully preserved burial that has these um, mass-produced stamp seals that seem to date to the 21st to 22nd dynasties. So that would also place us in this late Iron 1 to early Iron 2A period. So it's a child burial here, here. Again, this could indicate some of the Egyptian connections or perhaps continuities 
um, of um, Egyptianizing material. And these are very common in the region, I will, I will add. Um, but I, I mentioned the sort of disappearance of ceramic bowls or the very infrequent appearance of those. Um, but what we do find occasionally are these um, bronze vessels um, in the tombs. In, and they seem to be found mostly in those mud brick kissed tombs. So those seem to have been quite special. Um, this wine set here uh, was found actually uh, deposited over um, a male, adult male individual as well as uh, accompanied by um, a dressed carcass, uh, sort of a, a bovine or cow, a calf uh, uh, um, sort of uh, the body of a calf basically, the legs and the, the head and the tail have been removed. Um, so leaving the, the main body. So a really a, an elaborate, a pretty nice cut of meat for this tomb. So uh, in terms of what this means, it could mean that there's certainly indications of feasting kinds of paraphernalia and indications of meals and the idea of food either for the afterlife or being shared with the living at this time. Um, but this is a very rare finding and it could indicate the continuity of some of the elite practices but overall, the burials of this period are pretty poor materially. In terms of the disappearance of bowls, what's kind of interesting is when you look at sites like Wadi Fadan 40, which is further down uh, from the, uh, in the Wadi Araba, um, they, they actually have preservation of, of wooden bowls and also pomegranates in the graves. And this dates from the same period as the period two at Saidiya. So perhaps what we have actually at Sidere at this time is perhaps a shift towards organic um, vessels in some of the tombs. And we're just not seeing them archaeologically. So again, this points to this problem of visibility in the archaeological record. Also, it's interesting that the burials here have been identified with Shasu or nomadic peoples or semi-nomadic peoples. And so I don't know if there's any direct connection between these peoples and the ones that are at Saidea, I think they're, they're actually um, they're a bit different, but there's, there's certainly some elements that show similarities between these, these burial types. Um, Saidea for the, uh, this, this iron, early iron uh, two period, this late iron one, early iron two period, we have um, really um, a gap after that period. We, we don't seem to have many burials. There's, one sort of scanty burial that could date to the 8th or 7th centuries, but um, there's nothing really clear here. So it could be that people are burying off the mound by this time. Um, and then this brings me now to the Iron uh, to Sea and Persian period, the Tel El Mazar uh, Mound A, which was excavated by uh, Kaya Yassin at the University of Jordan uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. And here you see the mound. And then you also... and uh, this is, let me just move this across here. Um, so the cemetery A, um, which is, uh, you can see here, we have about 85 burials dated to this period. This is a completely different uh, period of time. It's um, really a period perhaps associated more with imperial domination of the region, whether that's in the Babylonian or the uh, Persian period. It's a very different kind of pattern to one that we've seen in the um, earlier Iron Age. Um, and what we see here is a pattern towards individualizing burials and individual burials. Many of them are flexed and some of them are extended. Um, some of them f uh, contain very elaborate bronze bowls. And you can go and see some of these in the University of Jordan Archaeological Museum, by the way, just across the way. Um, and this really is kind of what I'm going to focus on as well when we come back to Telus idea. We have this reversion back to the individual burial. Um, here you see the flexed individuals. There are a few brickline kists, but most of them are individual burials. There's also this uh, type of larnax or clay coffin burial. This is also in the uh, archaeology museum in the University of Jordan. This seems to be something that is a Mesopotamian uh, feature. It comes from Syro-Mesopotamia. It's not a feature that is, um, uh, seems to be a local feature. So this, this seems to be quite an elite or high status form of burial custom to use this type of coffin. Uh, 
So that's just a brief glimpse at Tel El Mazar, but now I'm going to come to Tel Asidea, um, where at that time in the Persian period, so the 6th to 5th, 4th uh, centuries BC, there's a residency that is established on the Upper Tel, and just about here, as you can see. And in the cemetery at this time, we have a reversion back to the individual type of burial. And the burials are much sparser this time. We've only got about 45 from this period um, represented. We've got men, women, and children, suggesting that we might have family groups here. We've got very much, much smaller numbers of people. And it could be that this is perhaps a small farmstead or perhaps it's a, a special kind of residence but it's not a very large population that is using this cemetery. And it's a very long period of time. It seems to be for a few centuries that this cemetery is in use. So quite sparse, but you can see there's a lot of organization. There's sort of a grid-like pattern, sort of head-to-toe pattern, but also uh, these columns as well. So a lot of cemetery organization. Within the tombs, um, there's fewer objects than the Late Bronze Age. Um, there's very few ceramic objects. We do find bronze objects, including weapons and bowls. We also find some very nice granulated silver jewelry in some of the graves. And you can see some of this here. Uh, this was found uh, with the burial of a, of a young child, as well as this zoomorphic uh, bottle here. So there's some quite nice objects in these, in these graves. And there's a big focus on adornment and on dining and those <coughs> kinds of things. Uh, so some of the finer things, I think. Um, what we have here in this grave is very intriguing. And that's, this is a, um, uh, a male individual that was found with the bronze bowl actually clasped between the teeth. So it's almost like it's been put there in the grave. It's like he's having a drink. So I wonder what this means. This could be accidental. Maybe it fell down into his mouth from his face because covering the face or putting a bowl under the head. That's something you find in Assyria, in Assyrian practice. You find it in, um, in the Persian period too. But it's very intriguing. And I wonder if this has something to do with this kind of culture of dining and feasting and banqueting you find across the Near East and the Eastern Mediterranean, um, whether that's in, the, in, in Assyria, in Nineveh, or whether that's in Sidon. Um, or whether that's in the Greek and, and Roman world as well, later on with the symposia. But we have this kind of tradition, I think, of emerging of this idea of partaking in a banquet, the dead actually partaking in a banquet with the living somehow. One of the interesting things that we find as well is there's no imported Greek pottery or coins. That's interesting because Greek pottery is making it across for, certainly to... Um, uh, to a, a man and to some of the wealthier tombs. Uh, but it's not found in the graves here, so there seems to be some selectivity, um, some reason why Greek pottery is not favoured here. Um, and coins, it's just pretty rare. You know, they're, there's just, they're found ma mainly in coastal uh, graves from this period. But also these weapons, um, trying to work out what these weapons might represent. And I have, a, I, have a, I have a hunch that this might actually relate not to necessarily warfare, but more to a kind of hunting metaphor. In Persian period seals, Achaemenid seals, hunting is a really big feature um, of the iconography. And this was a very idealized kind of form of uh, identity um, associated with elites. I think that this has something to do with the kind of uh, elite emulation. Um, uh, so focusing on banqueting, hunting, again, the good things in life and, rep and choosing to represent those in the, in the burial, whether that's for the afterlife or simply as a way of representing uh, the deceased individual. And here are some of those ornaments again. Um, and it's quite interesting that around half of the individuals um, uh, in the cemetery of this phase contained, uh, had ornaments found with them, uh, including seals, uh, uh, the stamp seals, for example, and fibulae. And so this seems to suggest that the individuals perhaps were sort of dressed for death, that they may have actually been wearing clothing rather than, say, wrapped in a burial shroud, as we say saw in uh, the Late Bronze Age period. So I'm getting towards the end of my talk now, and I, what I want you to uh, really think back on is, as I've gone through this um, 
these many different periods uh, from the early Bronze Age right through to the uh, Iron Age and Persian period, what we see, seem to see in the burials of the Jordan Valley is a sort of pattern of or oscillation between communal and multiple burials and close connections with the handling of human remains and then a shift towards more individual styles of burial and the focus on the individual. And then back again to, to multiple and then back again to individual. So we see this pattern going through and I'm not quite sure how to interpret this but I have a few ideas about what it might mean. And so I just want to conclude and I have actually just written out some uh, concluding thoughts which I want to read out to you. So to sum up, we have to really, first of all, um, be quite careful uh, because we have to acknowledge that I've been quite selective uh, in focusing on just a few key sites. Um, there are other cemeteries and burials um, that need to be integrated for both sides of the river as well as further down the Wadi Araba, the Wadi Fadan 40 for example. But this was really an interconnected world and we have to consider the degrees to which the people of the Jordan Valley were connected to the coastal region, they're connected north and south and also they're connected to the neighbouring highland regions too. So we have to think about um, this but we also have to think about the Jordan Valley as um, you know well actually one thing we do have to think about of course is ethnicity and burials and I want to just draw attention to this first of all uh, we have to be very very careful about the identification of ethnic groups in the archaeological record um, so the examples for example Kenyans uh, Amorite hypothesis of the late third millennium BC is a good case in point, but as well the Sea People's burials and the identification of burials that tell us idea. We have to be very careful about that. This isn't to rule out the possibility that a cemetery could contain the burials of individuals from diverse ethnic backgrounds, including Sea Peoples, Egyptians, Canaanites, etc. But that we have to be very careful not to identify single traits to indicate the ethnicity of the deceased. This doesn't stop us, however, from identifying elements of burial style or perhaps the selection of objects that could be affiliated culturally to Egypt or Mesopotamia or the Aegean, etc. This doesn't um, uh, necessarily... We, we can't, of course, rule out the possibilities of elite emulation, which I think is what we have in a lot of cases here. The Jordan Valley, as both a um, trade and communication route, was very important um, but also we have to think about the uh, the demographic impact on populations and king groups during times of imperial domination and social stress so when we look at those uh, different periods of time when we have this reversion to individual burials they seem to indicate they seem to mesh quite well with episodes of either um, impact on urban society or uh, impact of an imperial uh, dominant uh, culture on the region. So I think this could indicate some connections to the uh, connections with elite emulation and individual burials. Um, we also need to think about the uh, changes in attitudes towards death and the body and relationships between the living and the dead, especially the handling and the proximity of settlements and uh, cemeteries. So for example, um, there might be certain circumstances um, that could affect the ability uh, to bury um, individually, such as cemetery space. This could impact the choice of burial type. Um, but there does seem to be a major difference between the idea of burials in which uh, you have close contact between individuals, reuse of the same tomb resulting in direct physical contact with the remains of the dead or movement and transfer of human remains. We see a lot of handling of the dead in the cave tombs and the built tombs of the early Bronze Age and the Middle Bronze Age, um, and also those built tombs in the early Iron Age at Celis Idea. There's something very important about the bringing together of remains into one place, which may relate to the expression of kinship connections in death and the reinforcement of lineage 
of family groups. And as some have argued for the Iron Age, perhaps even patrimonial uh, lineage lineages. Um, but by contrast, in the Late Bronze Age, in the LB Iron One transition, there's a trend towards diversity of burial styles and a focus on individual body treatment. And let's tell us idea, we may also see the deliberate planning of the cemetery and careful management of burial plots. So taking into consideration the boundaries between individual burials and limiting the reopening of burials for reuse. The trend towards um, the individual pit, pit grave cemeteries in the Late Bronze Age has been theorized by many, uh, by some, and um, you know, we could see that this was an impact, for example, of the Egyptian domination of the region. Uh, for example, demographic factors uh, affecting families, affecting kin groups, um, forced labor, uh, taxes. Um, the families weren't necessarily able to keep connected. And perhaps it's their burial customs that were a very important part of expression of family identity. And so what we're seeing in these periods is kind of a social dislocation of the family and a shift more towards the practice of, of elevating the individual. But what is missing? As I've discussed in the introduction to this talk, there's a lot that we still don't know. We really, uh, we don't know or understand the beliefs behind the burial customs that we've seen here. There are many activities that we don't normally see in the archeological record, uh, but there were huge, perhaps for example, there were huge and conspicuous uh, feasts that took place after the funeral. Um, and they're just simply not preserved archeologically. There's a lot that we don't see. What the pit burial cemeteries of the Jordan Valley do provide us is they fill in some of the gaps, the contextual gaps, that are not preserved in the multiple burial caves on the plateau, which seldom have in situ primary burials. We're also missing clear information about the way in which tombs in open cemeteries were marked and visible to those living within the settlements, and to what extent they were visited or remembered by the living long after the burial. In summary, although burials can tell us a lot about the society, they can raise as many questions. And we have to be very careful about how much we want to read from the data that's available. Thank you very much for your attention.